today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Oakwilt. So this is uh, presentation is uh, titled towards actually my okay <laughs> towards early detection of Oakwilt in Maine, and this is, is based on what I you know what I know what I've learned about Oakwilt, and especially what we learned on a a, a training last uh, Mike Parisio and I went out to Minnesota and we traveled to Wisconsin uh, clear across Wisconsin actually um, in uh, yeah it was it was I think it was July last year was it early August I can't remember specifically but um, we went out there and uh, saw a lot of oak wilt in a lot of different places um, urban rural uh, tribal land and everybody had to deal with it in different ways. Um, we also toured lab facilities and, and got a better idea on the diagnostic work that needs to be done when verifying oak wilt. And also, you know, getting to see the fungus and culture, uh, getting to smell the fungus and culture, which sounds weird, but that's, um, it's, it's a very, uh, very specific smell to this. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but anyway, I'm just going to go through. This is not going to be a full hour, I don't believe. So you may find yourself with a little bit more time than you had planned on. <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the this afternoon or this forenoon. Um, but I'm going to go over the basics of what I know about oak wilt, and then there's going to be plenty of time for questions. So. Okay, so oak wilt is caused by the fungus Brettsiella fagaceiarum. Until recently, this was Ceratocystis fagaceiarum, and I, I guess just a, a note on fungal nomenclature: things are are changing daily. All the all the uh, names of fungi pathogens that uh, I learned in school are most of them have changed at at this point, so it's all all quite confusing. But um, oak wilt. It, the new name is Brettsiella uh, fagaceiarum. Oak wilt's a, pr a pretty good common name to use. Uh, that's pretty straightforward, not to be confused with many, many other things. So oak wilt's a vascular systemic fungus that's lethal to red oaks. It's a really similar, uh, this is, in terms of function, it's similar to Dutch elm disease. It's, uh, the fungus is vectored by a beetle like Dutch elm disease. It attacks the, the cambium just like Dutch elm disease and uh, parasitizes that cambial tissue, which in effect blocks any, you know, water nutrients that are coming from, from the roots, blocks, uh, you know, transport of, of those needed resources to any distal parts to, uh, to the, of the tree from the point of infection. Um, this causes wilting sim symptom, uh, discoloration of leaves and other, other symptoms that I'll be discussing here in a bit. Um, so oak wilt and the causal fungus were first described in Wisconsin in, or I think it was 1944. Um, and there's a lot of speculation about, about oak wilt. You know, Dutch elm disease uh, came from overseas. Um, they've been looking at the sort of the, the molecular work that's been done with oak wilt fungus ha has come with a couple different uh, scenarios, but I think the one that's the the most likely is that this disease originally uh, came from Central or South America, and maybe went through some changes. It's it's hard to say, um, but it uh, anyway showed up in our our uh, in our our native range of of oaks and has really done a lot. Um, a lot of damage and it's 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 spread far and wide. Uh, this is the oak. This is a distribution of oak wilt at, at the current time, and it really you know goes to the west. You know the the extent of of red oak to the west until you know you sort of hit that the border at the plains where you know things things change in, in terms of species composition. <coughs> and oak wilt is spreading to the east as well. You know. The Northeast New England is really the sort of the last area of our native oak forest that hasn't, uh, you know, that hasn't been impacted by oak wilt. So it's, you know, it's it's Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine 
uh, these are the states that uh, you know we, we've got red oak, we've got the uh, vectors, we just don't have the pathogen yet. And once we have those three things all in the same place, then we're going to have problems with uh, disease. And I do believe it's a matter of time before we're dealing with oak wilt. It's not a, it's not a, you know, are we going to get it or not type of a situation. We will be dealing with oak wilt. Um, it's just a, a matter of when oak wilt wilt uh, shows up in Maine. So I'm going to talk about the oak wilt life cycle. So this is the basics of the oak wilt -like life cycle. So the, the disease is primarily spread by sap feeding beetles and the uh, genus Nidadulidae, uh, or I guess that's a family, but anyway, the Nidadulid beetles. These are the, the beetles when you're out on your porch um, enjoying a, a beer or a glass of wine or cider or something like that. These are the, the beetles that always end up flying into your beer, essentially. They, they love the smell of yeasty, sweet things, and, and they seek them out. And uh, this is partially why oak wilt is so successfully vectored by these, these beetles. Um, there's also evidence of the, the oak wilt fungus being spread by twig beetles, and that results in uh, you know flagging branches sort of a, on a smaller scale. But it's still an introduction, and once oak wilt is introduced to a tree, it it uh, it doesn't it doesn't leave. Uh, and I'll talk more about that too in a little bit. But um, so these beetles are attracted to the sweet smell of the fungus' spore-producing structures. So the the these are the nitidulid beetles. Um, they are attracted to these fungal pegs because these fungal pegs. A lot of people describe it as smelling like juicy fruit bubble gum or or juicy fruit gum. And it does have a kind of a a tropical fruity smell to it. Um, and we we smelled when we were in the lab. They had a fungus growing in culture, and you, we were you know sticking our nose into these petri dishes. And it does definitely have a fruity smell. Um, and it is, in my opinion, sort of like this juicy fruit gum. That's what a lot of people use to describe it. So the beetles visit these uh, sticky fungal pegs. There's some there's some liquid that's uh, hev heavily populated with spores that these beetles, you know, get into, they feed a little bit, they get covered with the spores, and then they may fly to a wounded uh, oak tree. And this is a really important part of the, the life cycle. If the, if the oak trees don't have wounds, they're, you know, open wounds that are relatively fresh, they're not gonna get colonized with oak wheel fungus. And that's why you shouldn't, tr you shouldn't be pruning your, you should be pruning live wood off your oak trees in the summer. Um, really any time from, I would say, you know, early May to October. Um, and again, I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a future slide, just the, the, the period of infection. So after, like I say, the, so the beetles are attracted to that spore filled liquid that's really sweet smelling. They, they go and they visit a wound and the fungus colonizes the tissues and you start to see some symptoms and here are here are the symptoms. Um, you start to get uh, discolored, um, mottled appearance, and this is a really variable, um, really variable symptom. Sometimes it comes from the margin. Sometimes it's a whole leaf that looks a little bit uh, bleached out. But the, <coughs> excuse me, these are the classic leaf symptoms that that you see. But like I said, a lot of variability. So you start to see the 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 leaves changing um maybe maybe wilting and uh this could be you know the branch tip, branch tips or a, or a whole you know larger portion of of the crown of a tree <clears throat> and once once the infection has advanced and this is something that i that i learned uh on the on the oak wilt uh field training is that you know, with Dutch elm disease, when a tree has Dutch elm disease, you can pretty much rely on there being some kind of a staining of the cambium. You you slice, you know, you whittle back some of the bark and you can see staining. Um, that's not always the case with, with uh, Dutch elm disease because you can culture uh, the fungus from clear wood. But um, with oak wilt, it's a fairly um, unusual early infection to find the streaking. You only see the streaking later on in a pretty advanced you know, very obvious uh, infection. So that's not something that we can really rely on uh, as far as a, a di diagnostic uh, indicator. 
but it is something that 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 can be useful, I suppose. So once the once a tree is colonized with oak wilt, you have this uh, uh, the, the fungus moves through the vascular system and therefore it can move throughout the entire tree and it moves down into the roots. And if two adjacent oak trees happen to have a, a, a root graft, it's when two trees are growing in close proximity, the roots touch and you know the roots, they sort of form a common root system. And oaks definitely have a habit of doing this and especially have a habit of doing this on sandier soil. Um, and uh, the fungus can be passed in that way. So you can see at this this picture provided by by Bugwood of an aerial photo, and I think this is in Wisconsin, um, an area that uh, where you, you have a high concentration of oaks. Obviously, there was uh, an infection that occurred, and it sort of spread, likely through root graft, um, throughout this entire area. So this is a pocket of mortality uh, that that can be associated with um, um, oak wilt. <clears throat> so again, the, these new infected trees, they form these fungal pegs. These fungal pegs are, they're very strong and, and they'll, they'll grow and they'll actually force up the bark and in many cases crack the bark. So this also provides a nice sheltering place for, for insects that are attracted to, you know, the, the sweet smell of the, the fungal pegs. And uh, so it's, these cracks are hard to see sometimes, but uh, it's pretty amazing that the, the fungus can can grow and generate the kind of force to pop open the bark of a tree from inside. So one, one really important thing to, to realize about oak wilt is that it's the it's the the trees in the red oak group. Um, the, you know, the the. The oaks that are native to North America, like red oak, pin oak, um, these these red oak group oaks that you know typically have the pointed tips to their leaves unlike the white oak groups that have like the more round leaf margins uh, it's the red oaks that are uh, severely affected and show the most um, the most uh, severe symptoms the quickest white oak groups definitely get oak wilt but they they tend to the the, the infection tends to persist for a fairly long time um, and unfortunately, the, the white oaks are kind of like a reservoir for the disease. So uh, when, when you're treating the red oaks and, you know, really managing hard to get get oak wilt under control in a certain area, um, if there's white oaks around that are harboring the in infection, like, a, you know, just like a white oak, swamp white oak, bur oak, um, you know, that it really pre presents a, a challenging situation when you have like a reservoir of disease and trees that are somewhat symptomatic um, they, they do they do die but it, it just takes a very long time whereas with oak wilt the tree can die within a month so back to the the, the smell of the the fungus so there uh, uh, Karen Kaluzzi sent this article to me actually a couple people did um, the they've trained dogs now in in New York to seek out oak wilt and they're very good at it it turns out um, I mean they train dogs to sniff for things like you know narcotics, bed bugs, all sorts of things. Why not oak wilt? And actually, some of the foresters that uh, work with oak wilt on a regular basis, they they say that they can even smell it, um, you know, just on the wind when they're in an area, um, and they claim to be pretty good at it. Uh, I, I so I guess who needs dogs? But uh, when you've got a really good trained forester, I suppose. Anyway. Uh, general oak wilt precautions. So how do you prevent getting oak wilt? Don't prune your oak trees during the growing season. All fresh wounds on oak trees are attracted to the beetles that spread the oak wilt fungus. Um, and be vigilant in areas where wind events have damaged oak trees. So there's been some situations where there's been, you know, and this is in the Midwest, so they have more of these like straight line winds and, and uh, heavy hail storms with, you know, golf ball size hail, that kind of thing. When, when those weather events create a lot of open wounds um, and there is oak wilt in the area there tends to be very large outbreaks but the, the main thing is to keep an eye out for oaks in your area and report all incidences of oak wilt or wilting oak branches or whole trees wilting or dying um, any early summer defoliation uh, of oak trees is something to to report to 
preferably me or or to uh, you know somebody in the main forest service who will hopefully pass that information on to me. So any suspect trees, I'd like to know about them. And and that early defoliation is something that there are certain there are certain symptoms of uh, of oak wilt that are inconsistent across geographically. So they say that people that see it in West Virginia, they say that they never see fungal pegs. They're probably there somewhere, but they don't see them. Uh, people in Minnesota say that staining is not a great uh, indicator for them. But early summer defoliation of oaks, just uh, oaks dropping a bunch of their leaves at a time when they're not supposed to, is a really good indicator that the, there might be oak wilt in, in the area or infecting that particular tree. So again, to review the symptoms, leaf symptoms are discoloration and modeling and not always wilt, wilt symptoms early on in the infection. But you can see from these pictures that there's a lot of variation. These trees are infected with oak wilt and there's really no consistent pattern and not all the tr not even all the leaves on a branch um, can be symptomatic. So it's 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 a little bit tricky. Um, here's some oak wilt mortality pockets. They can appear, uh, crown symptoms can appear from June through September. I would even say, yeah, it, th this was a, a real eye opener for me. I thought that oak wilt was something that just kind of happened maybe in July, and that's when you have the, the highest rate of infection. But the tree on the on the right, we were we were there, I guess it was August actually, and that tree was perfectly fine in the weeks prior and, and just in about, I said about a week and a half to two weeks, that tree just really declined rapidly. And they had done some some removals and some some trenching, and I'll talk about those techniques a little bit later, but they, they had done some work to manage oak wilt and they thought they had it all cleaned up. And then all of a sudden this tree just went up in, in, in flame, so to speak. It just uh, really died and crashed quickly. <laughs> there can also be late season infections that sort of stay latent throughout the throughout the winter and then they can show the sim symptoms can start early in the spring. Uh, the tree on the left was in a real sandy soil nor north of the Twin Cities and that was an area that uh, had quite a lot of oak wilt. And one thing to keep in mind about oak wilt and one of the difficulties of managing it is that any size tree can get oak wilt. So if you have oak wilt on a site there can be seedlings that uh, have oak wilt. You're managing the big trees, but the seedlings can harbor the disease and oak wilt can stay um, after you cut down a tree. If there's any roots living um, from that tree or that remain living, uh, oak wilt can persist on a site for as much as five, five years after removals. So after tree removals. So it's, it's, a, really, it's a really difficult one to, to manage. So again, staining in the xylem, it may not be visible early on in infection, uh, and it may not develop until infected trees are in advanced stages of, of wilt. Um, it's, a, it's a great indicator if it's there. That's the kind of tissue that you want to do isolations. It's, it's great tissue for confirming oak wilt disease, but uh, you can also culture oak wilt disease from branches that aren't stained. So here's the pictures, close, closer up pictures of the fungal pressure pegs. Um, these generate the pressure that cracks the, the bark, and it's it's pretty amazing that it can be that the fungus can do this. Uh, the sweet smell attracts the beetle vectors that bring the disease to other areas, and uh, the beetles travel to wounds on healthy oaks. Uh, so you can, if you look closely on the picture on the left, there is a a bark crack here and there was a fungal pressure pad under there pretty hard to see this was about 10 feet up um so i mean you can see that uh oak wilt can be there the tree can be showing some symptoms uh and actually this tree was was stone cold dead i think but um w was uh, producing the, the pressure pegs just uh and here you can see the 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 mass of, of fungus that uh, produces the spores and uh, creates the pressure that pops open the bark. Now I'll talk briefly about oak wilt management uh, and that consists of removing trees using a vibratory plow, 
uh, girdling trees and using herbicide. Um, so first talk about vibratory plow and the vibratory the vibratory plow is like a giant knife that uh, yeah, a bulldozer can drag through the forest and it's it's designed to sever any root grafts and uh, it's about a five foot deep trench that is uh, that is dug around an infection center because um, as I said oaks especially on sandy soil or soil that's not rocky uh, have a tendency to graft the roots um, a lot of trees do this maples do this uh, elms do this uh, oaks probably do this here in maine too but there's some speculation that maybe they they don't root graft as readily in rocky soil so that's that's one question that kind of remains unanswered about uh, about root graft and, and the, the prospect of oak wilt being transmitted from tree to tree underground in a place like Maine, um, you know, it, let's say, OK, in a place like central Maine, I mean, I I've been doing a little bit of gardening lately and gosh, there's a lot of rocks in the soil up here. Of course, it's different when you get down uh, down in the south east and closer to the coast. But anyway, soil texture and the soil type has has a lot to do with how readily or seemingly has a lot to do with how readily uh, trees uh, graft their roots. So here's uh, two models. It's uh, there's the kind of the basic model, the original rule of thumb and then the, the modified rule of thumb. And this essentially um, consists of using a vibratory plow to cut roof root grafts in the in in close proximity to the the, the infected trees and as a precaution <coughs> in case there's already been root to root transmission to um, adjacent trees there's a second uh, barrier that's uh, dug and actually you name this the secondary barrier as the one that's closest to the infected trees and the primary barrier being the one that's further away but uh, this is anyway designed to Kind of have a, a backup root graft break in case there's already been transmission. Now there, the expert uh, modification, expert user modification of the rule of thumb, actually does two passes about one to two feet apart with the vibratory plow. <coughs> excuse me, and that's to <coughs> excuse me uh, discourage. Uh, so when the roots are are wounded you know they're obviously going to grow back and they're going to grow smaller fine roots and those are going to sort of spread out and um by by having that second uh, barrier and you know one to two feet apart it, it does uh they say it cuts down on the ability of the, the disease to spread underground and so this is kind of based on um uh, distance of the, you know the closest asympt asymptomatic trees it, there's all sorts of tables and metrics that you can use when you're actually employing this method, but uh, and I won't go into the details with that or any of the other management models, but uh, this is sort of what a diagram of what um, management might look like. Um, the girdle herbicide treatment is something that we we were on. Uh, we were uh, invited to Menominee. Um, tribal land in Wisconsin and this was the they've of course tried to use a lot of different uh, techniques to um, they, to to combat or to, to manage their oak will issue and they have you know some very beautiful and well managed forests and they have beautiful oak um, but unfortunately they do have oak wilt as well and this girdle herbicide treatment is the one that they kind of swear by and it's based on uh, intertree distance and soil type and the DBH diameter at breast height of the, the infected tree. So if you've got a 12 uh, a, a infected tree that's got a diameter at breast height of 12 inches, um, you're basically going to um, girdle and kill uh, anything within um, 18 and a half feet of of that tree uh, and uh, on loamy soil and then uh, you know 23.3 feet of sandy soil when you're in sandy soil and this and th this is what it looks like so you've got an infected tree 
uh, and they go and they mark these trees and they uh, basically cut them around the, the base with a chainsaw and then inject or spray into the, the wound created by the chainsaw uh, some, you know, pretty hot herbicide that's specifically designed to kill woody plant or woody, yeah, woody plants. And they uh, basically kill all those trees and then they leave them, they leave them standing until they dry out a little bit. Um, and then they, uh, they cut them down and then they saw them up. So they're actually not losing, they're not, this resource is not going to waste, but it, uh, they're not able to achieve you know their goal of you know very large let's say veneer quality logs um, due to yeah the impacts of oak wilt so yeah and, and when when they girdle these trees the fungus is not it, once the trees start to dry out a little bit they're not able to to create the the fungal pegs don't form and that's of course how the the disease, disease gets spread around. Yeah, so the fungus requires living tissue to uh, to survive and, and and spread. So some people have asked me about, about injections for high value, value trees. Uh, so you know, oaks in parks, or let's say on a boulevard, or by a historic building. You know, some some arborists will tell you that. Uh, that this is a cure. It's a it's a therapeutic. I mean, it's a it's, you know a cure for for oak wilt, but it's not. It's therapeutic at best. What it does is kind of arrest symptoms, um, and keep keeps them from getting worse. Uh, they do say that it, it can be when it's used as a preventative. It can be um, you know more effective, kind of like with Dutch elm disease. Um, so the and what what they're using here is uh, propiconazole. And uh, yeah, that once infection ha has occurred in a tree, um, it f f firstly, when you inject a tree, the tree's health and vigor and size of crown, the temperature, um, how much sun the tree is getting, all of those things um, influence how much or influence the level of uptake and how much how much. Uh, of the active ingredient is absorbed into all the tissues of the tree. And studies have shown that there's very variable uh, levels of propiconazole uptake, uptake when these trees are injected. And the presence of the pathogen dur uh, is, is, has been confirmed during the treatment um, and after the, after the treatment as well. Um, so this is, is not, a, not a curative treatment. It's therapeutic at best and uh, should really only be reserved for, for high value trees and not looked at as some kind of a solution. Well, your tree gets oak wilt, well, you just inject it with some, you know, um, you know miracle cure and it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna bounce back. It's unfortunately not that simple. So here are my oak wilt takeaway messages. So the symptoms are highly variable and they seem to differ geographically. Things like staining may not be seen at all, or it may be only seen in very late stages of the disease. Uh, the leaf symptoms are, are highly variable, um, ra very wide ranging. Uh, the time frame for infection and crown symptoms is much longer than I originally thought, spanning from late May through September. Uh, and again, that's because of uh, late season infection, latent infection that doesn't really take hold and really show symptoms until the next spring. Um, and you know, and the thing the thing about oak wilt is is it's it's a highly virulent um, fung high, highly virulent pathogen. It can kill a mature tree within a month. It can also persist and it can span several years. And again, that's more common on your white oaks. And, and your red oaks are the ones that typically die in short order. And then you know in there's just a lot of variability in that too, but it's it's kind of alarming that a, a full size a mature tree can be killed within a month of infection. It's very uh, very fast paced uh, decline. Also, the disease can persist on a site, living on roots underground for much as five years after management. So frequent follow ups are crucial to successful management. This isn't something that you just try to manage and walk away from. You've got to be back on site several times a year 
for several years until you're sure that you've been able to control it. And, and this has been this has been proven again and again in, in New York. They've really they really tried extremely hard to eradicate this from from the areas where it's shown up. And, and I forgot to mention this if you didn't take note in the, the distribution slide. Um, the closest infection or the closest confirmed Oakwood infection is, is Long Island, New York, um, Western, sorry, Eastern New York. There's a spot in Eastern New York that they've been battling that's sort of gone away and then reappears and then goes away and then reappears someplace else. Um, so it's uh, really important that when you are managing an area for, for oak wilt that you continue to go back. Um, that's that's crucial to successful management. And I guess I didn't realize that even the smallest little oak wilt can have can have oak wilt can harbor oak wilt, and that makes that makes managing this fairly challenging. So oak wilt causes for concern. Contact the Maine Forest Service Inter Insect and Disease Lab if you see wilting oak branches or whole trees that are wilting. Summer defoliation of oaks, and that's one that I, I really want to impress upon everybody. If oaks are dropping their leaves in the summer, I'd really like to know about it. Of course, it could be something like oak anthracnose that's causing this, but it also could be oak wilt. And the, so the sooner that we identify um, oak wilt and manage it, the better chance we have of preventing its spread and, uh, you know, preventing it from being, you know, another one of those uh, persistent, uh, very serious, uh, you know, fungal pathogens or, you know, tree, agents of tree decline and, and mortality. Um, and also, if there's a pocket of several dead oak trees <coughs> that you would happen to come across, in your travels or you'd happen to notice when you're driving down the road that's definitely something to, to check out as well um, or something to inform us of but i'd really like to just to, to focus on summer defoliation uh, that's that's a, a really great indicator of uh, cause for concern so in closing uh, there's a lot that we're still learning about uh, oak wilt and how to effectively manage it i mean that's it's something that uh, is you know people are making progress all the time but it's uh it's definitely a work in progress um and please contact the main forest service with any questions about oak wilt, oak wilt fungus uh, oak wilt fungus and its management um and i can be found in the deering building 90 blossom lane and at the contact information presented here and i believe that's that's it um, and with that, I will take any questions. Any questions about Oakwood? I got a uh, question for you in the comments if you got access to the comments. I uh, yeah, let's look here. Okay, so question: um, If a tree is cut from removal, but the stump is left behind, is that raw stump a potent potential vector to pass the via root grafts? Oops, I just lost my my window. Um. It all depends if you know if if, uh, if that. I mean, after a tree is cut, there is a potential for the, uh, the for the fungus to create uh, a fungal peg, attract vectors, and spread the disease. Um, it the the possibility of that decreases quite rapidly over time as that uh, as the as the as the um, as the as the material dries because the, the fungus does need living tissue to survive but the living tissue can be underground and, and they were saying in uh, in minnesota that uh, after they cut and remove trees um, the the root system can stay viable for quite some time and may 
you know, there might be some sprouts that, that come up and and uh, as long as that tissue is alive and, and somewhat moist, uh, there is a possibility for the, the fungal eggs to be formed. Uh, and, you know, there's the question of firewood that, that comes up, you know, may, may come to someone's mind. They do say that oak wilt can be spread via firewood. Um, and uh, because it, the firewood can, you can transport the vectors in firewood firewood and 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 the uh, the fungal pads can be in firewood i don't know how you know on, on a I, it's tough to say you know there's some level of danger and i guess that's that's enough for me <laughs> uh i i think any anything that has the potential for for spreading uh, oak wilt and you know Bringing oak wilt to Maine is something that I, I want to avoid. So, I think firewood is is uh, is a danger. Um, yeah, any move movement of yeah of trees that have been affected or or seedlings or anything like that from areas that have oak wilt. I think that's all um, all all represents some kind of a danger to our our resource. Somebody asked about the presentation where the recordings being posted. Gre Greg Lord has been posting them to our YouTube channel, the Forest Service YouTube channel, and I can, Kim, I can get you a link to that after. Okay, Greg's already, Greg's already taking care of that. My bad. Um, are there any more questions in the comments, or anybody have a question that they want to ask directly? Okay. Um, you showed the, the pictures of the trenching. That was in um, Sid, Wisconsin. Yeah. Well, yeah. That that, that particular trenching was in uh, Minnesota, but they did do that a fair amount. Who's paying for that? Are these the landowners that are are paying for that? Is this some sort of a state eradication? Yeah. Program? You know, I had a slide on that. I don't. I'm, I might have skipped over it now that uh, you mention it. But uh, that's that's the. That's a big con with the, uh, you know, in, in terms of pros and cons, that's a huge con with the with the vibratory plow because those machines are really expensive. They're not only expensive to run, they're expensive, of course, to buy. Um, they're also expensive to to constantly service and um, and move. So, you know, the huge budgets um, are needed for using the vibratory plow um, and it was a city that, that particular uh, vibratory plow trenching was being done at a city park and the reason they were doing that is because it's a park that's frequented by a lot of people from minneapolis and and there are people that don't tolerate um you know losing a lot of trees um girdling trees spraying herbicide there's a lot of uh, public resistance to that and that's why they were um, you know, spending the extra resource to, to use a vibratory plow. And the director, the, the park person that was there speaking to us, he was, uh, he was saying that vibratory plow is the, it's the best for management in terms of public relations. Um, it's probably not the most efficient way, and it's certainly the most, you know, very expensive way to try to manage oak wilt, but it's, uh, it's it's appropriate for certain settings. Thank you. That makes sense. Yep. The hack and squirt method is a lot cheaper because yeah. just make you know you need a sprayer and some chemical and uh, a chainsaw. <clears throat> but it is it it does you end up killing a lot of trees that probably don't maybe don't even have oak wilt, but you know it's kind of a better better safe than spray. Because uh, it's it's very hard it, once once oak wilt is in an area, it's really hard to to get rid of it and and keep it away. And uh, they're really trying to protect their the the larger forest resource by sacrificing you know some some acres in in a in a isolated spot. Thank you, Aaron and Oliver. This is Mike. I'll just chime in on that too from working out there. I want to say I remember that the Michigan DNR had actually purchased their own vibratory plow 
and just mention that, yeah, Minnesota, the Department of Natural Resources there, they do have a cost share program uh, to kind of defray some of the costs. But, um, yeah, still obviously super expensive to landowners and often a, a barrier to actually getting the treatment without the, uh, the cost share program. Yeah, I know in, in New York, they they kind of dig trenches. That, I don't know that they use a, a vibratory plow, but if they, in, you know, in some of the urban areas where they've been trying to trying to manage oak wilt, and I don't know if Tom Schmelk's on the call, he probably knows a little bit more about this just due to his time in New York and his involvement with that. But, um, you know, they're actually digging trenches and putting in physical, physical barriers, um, giant cloth barriers i don't know if it's cloth it's some kind of like tarp type material to uh isolate the trees and, and prevent roots from spreading and grafting um and, sp and transmitting the disease via root graft it's it's an expensive one for sure and like i said we've got we've got the vectors and we've got uh we've got the host we just don't have the fungus yet and so um we're keeping our fingers crossed and hope that uh, over time we can prevent our prevent Maine from getting oak wilt and hopefully techniques um, progress and uh, we'll be better able to manage it when it does actually get here. So again, if there are any more questions, you can always send them to me via email. Um, but this does conclude our Forest Health webinar series and uh, really appreciate everybody who's participated and um, listened in. Uh, and, and again, I, I will repeat that if, uh, if you got any feedback for us, that'd be great. We can learn from that and make, uh, if there is a second round of this, we can make, uh, we can uh, improve and, and make this a better experience for everybody. And also, if you've got other topics that you might like to hear, we can add those to a list. And you know, we may pick up something and, and do more with this in the fall when uh, things quiet down, um, work-wise, field-wise. So, all right, folks. Again, thanks for your participation and uh, hope you have a great rest of your